Good evening, my friends, and welcome to another online Bible study here at Bethlehem Baptist Church. Uh, we do this every Thursday evening from 9 o'clock to about 9.20, 9.25. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We are in a series. Uh, we are unlocking the Old Testament 39 keys to 39 bugs. Last year we did the New Testament, and I'm going to do the Old Testament just to, as an introduction, kind of key verse, key moment. Whet your appetite to get more into God's Word. And we are in 2 Kings tonight. We looked at 1 Kings last week, and we're looking at 2 Kings tonight, the key verse and the key moment for that. And it picks up where 1 Kings leaves off. 2 Kings covers 191 years. From the middle of Ahaziah's reign through 560 BC when King Jehoiachin was released by the king of Babylon. This book includes the conquering of the northern kingdom of Israel by the Assyrians in 722 BC and also the conquering of the southern kingdom of Judah by Babylon in 586 BC. And uh, we looked at that last week and how the kingdom was divided between north and south. Ten tribes in the north, uh, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, uh, which is Judah and Benjamin in the south. The theme of this book is the same as 1 Kings. The welfare of Israel and Judah depended upon the covenant faithfulness of the people and their king. The purpose is the same as 1 Kings, to give an account of the reigns of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, first by describing one kingdom's history, then retracing the same period of time for the other kingdom. It goes back and forth. The key word, whereas last, last week in 1 Kings was the division of the kingdom, this week is the captivities of the kingdom. We see things wind down. Together, First and Second Kings, it traces the monarchy of Israel from the point of its greatest prosperity under Solomon to its demise and its destruction in the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities. Strong emphasis is placed upon God's faithfulness to his covenant he blesses obedience and punishes disobedience as he told them there in the book of Deuteronomy and the, as well as the, he punishes the evils of idolatry. When you look at the kings, you can trace the kings and you can trace their, um, their morality, their character, and how the character of the leadership affects the people of a nation. In the northern kingdom of Israel, you see after Rehoboam, you see a drop in character and morality of the kings as it goes down in judah you see it go down and then it levels off with a good king and it goes down a little bit more levels off but each time it levels off and is good it's never the same as it was as they self-destruct sort of and they go into captivity in second kings there's two sections the first section is that of the divided kingdom it picks up where first kings leaves off chapters 1 through 17. In this section, we see King Ahaziah leading Israel to do evil in the northern kingdom. He falls and injures himself, and God sends Elijah to tell him, you're going to die on the bed you're lying on. The next scene ends Elijah's ministry, where Elijah, this, this, uh, this subplot going on with the, the man of God, Elisha asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit and sees Elijah go up to heaven. In a fiery chariot. This section deals with the ministry of Elisha and the prophet in the context of the kingdom of Israel going back and forth from Israel to Judah. This section, chapters 1 through 17, it ends with Assyria, the Assyrian army, the Assyrian empire, attacking and defeating the capital city there of Samaria in 722 BC. It shifts gears and goes to the kingdom of Judah, the remaining kingdom of Judah. That's the second part of this book from chapter 18 to chapter 25. And it picks up on the remaining kingdom of, of uh, David, uh, the line of David, and that of the good king of Hezekiah. And we follow the lineage of the kings in those chapters on up to Nebuchadnezzar's attack by the Babylonian army. We go to Hezekiah, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, this section ends with Babylon attacking and defeating Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom in 586 BC. The books of 1 and 2 Kings were written to explain to the Israelites in exile 
that the reason for their humiliating circumstances was their stubborn persistence on being unfaithful to the Lord. After a great deal of patience, after a great deal of grace, God had, had no choice but to bring the exile upon his people and impose the curses of his covenant with them in order to teach them, in order to disciple them. Curses that had been declared centuries earlier. The fact that the exile is due to sin is clearly stated in regard to the northern kingdom, as we're going to get to just a moment in 2 Kings 17, and is also in regard to the southern kingdom in 2 Kings 21. But if there's a key moment in this book of the Bible, a key moment, we will find it in 2 Kings 17, verse 7 to 23. In this passage of scripture, this chapter 17, it ends the first section of the book of 2 Kings and, and switches gears to the remaining southern kingdom in that second section. And that this key moment, it switches gears and it's making clear that the exile of the inhabitants of Israel to Assyria happened because they had sinned against the Lord their God and had feared other gods and walked in the statutes of the heathen. Our text tonight, this key moment, speaks of the bondage on a practical level, the bondage that can happen when one continues to harden their hearts. The focus of the chapter of this chapter, 2 Kings, is the kingdom of Israel and how they never had a king that did right inside the Lord. Never had a king with character, never had a leader with morality, and never could influence them for good. Verses 1 through 6 of chapter 17 concludes the northern kingdom of Israel. They're being conquered and taken into bondage by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. This chapter goes on to explain in verse 7 through 23 that the reason, the primary cause, is that of idolatry. Verse 24 to 41 of chapter 17 shows us the process of how the Assyrians acclimated this kingdom into their empire. They shipped off the men. They replaced the cities of Samaria, the capital, with their men and their priests, resulting in a, in a uh, half-breed people known in the New Testament as the Samarians, or the Samaritans, excuse me, with worship of half-pagan, half-spiritual, half-Jew, half-Gentile, which sets the tone for me of the stories in the New Testament. However, it didn't have to be this way. But because of the idolatry in their hearts, they continue to hearken and harden their hearts toward generation after generation. And to the spiritual bondage, they resulted in a literal physical bondage. The question is, why did their heart harden? We ask the same question. What causes our heart to harden? I believe that in verse 13 through 16, he gives us three reasons why our hearts can harden. So let's look here in verse 13 through verse 16. Let's read this together. It says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah. By all of his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffen their necks. They harden their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. Number one, our heart hardens when we are exposed to truth, but we don't embrace that truth. We see here in those two verses that God used prophets in that day to testify against Israel and against Judah about what they were doing wrong and to encourage them to turn back, to repent, keep the commandments of the Lord. Hey, there's still time. There's grace. And he goes on to say they harden their necks. They stiffen their necks like that other fathers. They did not believe the Lord. Hardening their necks, stiffening their necks is another way of saying they were stubborn. Stubbornness in our lives, my friend is having or showing dog determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially in spite of the good arguments or reasons to do so. What I'm saying is this. When we are repeatedly exposed to a particular truth of the Word of God, maybe through preaching, through reading, through listening, through devotions, and we refuse to embrace that and apply it, we are actively developing a hardened heart. 
When we repeatedly say no to God in a particular area of our life, we are developing a hard heart. And these people in this text were saying, no, I want to keep that idol in my life. You cannot have that, God. And when we hear the truth of the word of God and we hear the truth and we hear the truth and we hear the truth and we keep ignoring it and ignoring it and ignoring it, our hearts will grow harder and harder and harder and harder. When you work out in the yard without gloves, at first the rake rubs against your skin and it hurts a little bit. There is a sensitivity to the consequences created by the friction. But after a while, if you go for a while without gloves, your skin begins to toughen up. Gradually, you develop calluses on your hands. Eventually, you feel nothing at all. Your skin gets so thick that insulates your nerve endings, and you just can't feel it anymore. The sensitivity is gone. And that's what happens to our hearts, my friend. When we repeatedly say no to God and no to God, no to God, our hearts can become so hard and so calloused that we can't even hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. He's still speaking but we cannot hear him. He's still at work, but we are in no position to respond. We have lost our spiritual sensitivity. And the real tragedy of a hard heart is its long range consequences. When we continually shut the Lord out of one area of our lives, it affects our ability to discern his voice in other areas as well. And once an individual loses the ability to discern the promptings of God's spirit, he or she becomes open to just about anything. That's the first thing we looked at. Let's look at verse 15 now, number two. It says this, And they rejected his statutes and his covenants that he made with their fathers, and his testimonies which he had testified against them. Your heart hardens, number two, when you reject God's standards for your standards. Notice here in this verse, not only do they harden their necks, not only do they be stubborn and, and calloused, they rejected the statutes, the covenant, the testimonies of God, the law of God, the word of God. They rejected God's standards for their standards. So what I'm saying is this. The people of Israel took their covenant and law that God gave them and rejected parts of them to fit their standards. Their heart came a little more hardened. In our lives, whenever God's standard conflicts with our personality, our lifestyle, our circumstances, an interesting thing happens. Our first instinct as human beings with a sin nature is to tweak his standard. We adjust it just a little bit to fit our lifestyle. Oh, it's nothing personal. It's simply human nature. We have a natural propensity to change the rules of God. We tend to change his commands to fit our personality or our present lifestyle or our current circumstances. In fact, Christians are masters at this game. Because we've had years of practice hearing the truth and dodging the bullets. We've long since perfected our moves. And so subconsciously, we emphasize those parts of scripture that fits our personalities and standing in life. And when confronted with the truths that conflict with our personalized version of Christianity, we downplay them. And without thinking about it, we assign a value to various issues based upon how they fit our lifestyle and our goals. Sure, we know what God said about those things. But we convince ourselves that those things are not all that important to God. And every once in a while, we'll hear a sermon that steps on our toes and hits close to home and it hurts a little bit. And instantly you start looking for a way to ease out of it. And you think, yeah, it's, I know that's true, but I have all these other issues to deal with. Or I know what the Bible says, but I'll have to wait because I'm just not ready for that yet. Or we say this, my situation is different. My circumstances are unusual. My past has made me the way I am. And all the while, you can't wait to get out, out to the car so you can turn on the radio, tune in a song and go home, tune into a ball game or something and forget about what you just heard from the word of God. There's just one problem. When we change God's standard, it's not God's standard no more. We create a caricature of Christianity. One, it doesn't accurately reflect what God truly thinks. Instead, it exaggerates certain things and, and certain features and it distorts some and minimizes others. And, and most of us are so good at this technique that we practice it without even realizing it. And the more we do it, the better we feel about ourselves. And you know, there's a whole lot of issues of our heart. I can go on about gossiping, rebellion, disrespect, bad attitude, anger, desensitized by the very thing that we're against. 
The point is you can look and act like a good Christian on the outside, praise the Lord and have it all together, but on the inside you've rejected God's standards and adopted your own standards. I have no doubt in this text that the children of Israel, while they were worshiping idols, they still did some of the things of the law, but they had adopted it to their standard. It all comes from the heart. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. It all comes from the Holy Spirit of God. And if you're a Christian tonight, you should be growing to perfect these qualities in your life. And when the inside is taken care of, it lines up with the outside. Life is all about maintaining relationships, loving God, loving others. And the more we adopt God's standards on that issue, the softer our heart gets. Number three. Let's look at the rest of verse 15 and verse 16. It says, They followed idols, became idolaters, and went after the nations who were all around them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. So they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made for themselves a molded image and two calves, made a wooden image and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. Number three, my heart hardens when I follow my God instead of the God. Notice what the text says. They followed after vanity, emptiness. They became vain, empty. That sounds like a hardened heart toward the things of God. To the extent they looked at and they acted and they talked just like the world around them. And we notice verse 16. Eventually they left all the commandments of the Lord. So they left eventually at times as we started adopting things to our standard they left all the commandments of the Lord their God. And they made molded images, even two calves. That was King Jeroboam. They made a grove. They worshiped all the host of heaven. And they served Baal that was under King Ahab. It goes back to the leadership all the way down as they influenced. Idolatry had always been a problem from Israel from the time they came out of Egypt. But as it progressed, it got worse. And it progressed in the Baal worship under King Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel. Now understand, Israel still believed in God, Jehovah God at the time, but because the, he to them was like the God of power and does the big things, but only everyday little things, they, like their economical things for their agrarian society, and they, they worship Baal to handle those things. You can't shove the fence, my friend. You're the for God or against them. And when things got bad, they cried out to the true God, and when things are fine, they worship Baal and the host of other gods for the little mundane things. And aren't we the same? Aren't we the same? Don't we go to God when things get tough? But when things are fine, we kind of go back to our entertainment, our pleasures, our desires, our goals, our gods, our idols. Whatever it is you put before the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. We all struggle with idolatry. The thing about the Bible is times have changed, cultures have changed, but people remain the same. We all struggle with idolatry. And consequently, most of us live in a distorted picture of Christianity. We try to remold the Christian life to fit our own life. And when we do, we become guilty of idolatry. As we allow our hearts to harden toward God, we edit his program. We de-emphasize and we re-emphasize to the point where we end up worshiping a God that doesn't even exist. Tailored to ourselves. We create them ourselves. We bear a striking resemblance to the God of the Bible, but our God is personalized, custom-made a variation of the real thing, an idol. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. They became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds, four-footed feet, beasts, and creeping things. Here's the bottom line, my friend. You can worship the God of purity and holiness and submit yourselves to the cross of Christ. Or you can worship a God that simply makes you feel accomplished, affirm all your strengths, and never touches your tender spots. But they're not the same God. God is committed to reshaping your inner person, making you and conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ, to grow you, to become like Christ, to mature you. That's the goal, becoming like Christ tonight. That's that key moment, which leads to those key verses, 2 Kings 17, 18 through 20. And it picks, and it's actually the same key verse, but let me give you these key verses here. 2 Kings 17, 18 through 20. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. 
There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. And also Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statues of Israel, which they made. And the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, afflicted them, delivered them into the hand of the plunderers, until he cast them from his sight. The consequences of sin. And we look at uh, chapter 23 of 2 Kings. Chapter 23. And there's another key verse here in verse 27. And the Lord said, I will also remove Judah from my sight as I have removed Israel and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. As a description of what God was doing in Israel and in Judah through the book of second Kings, as they remained divided with wicked Kings and wound up into captivity, the bondage of their heart came out physically application. We all struggle with sin. We all fall into temptation from time to time. All of us have character flaws that we are not aware of. And a hard heart is not a heart that is necessarily in conscious rebellion against God. It is a heart that no longer feels the conviction of God. That's what a hard heart is. A heart that no longer feels the conviction of God. It's a heart that has grown insensitive to the voice of God. Hardness translates to numbness. And numbness by definition is sometimes difficult to detect. It is possible to maintain that religious routine and go through the motions while our heart is hard as steel. In fact, it's human nature to overcompensate for our disobedience by over overachieving in other areas. As a result, a surprising number of the world's hard, best hard-hearted people are tremendously good religious church-going people. Good people, just hard hearts. How can I determine if I have a hard heart? There's a simple equation here. The degree of one's hard heartedness is equal to the disparity between what grieves that person and what grieves God. The questions to ask is this, am I grieved by the same things that grieve the Lord? Do I feel as God feels? Am I bothered by the things that bother God? Is my heart in sync with his? And how will I know that through the word of God? Every week through media, through movies, through videos, through social media, etc. We can entertain and desensitize ourselves with depictions for the very sins which Christ died for. While we, when they don't embrace truth, they don't know what grieves the heart of God. And when we reject Christ's standards for our own, we don't know what grieves the heart of God. We follow idols. We may re remain aloof to what grieves the heart of God. And when the, what grieves God no longer grieves you, your heart's hard. What bothers God doesn't bother you anymore. Your heart's hardening or you're already hard. If somebody spent a week carefully watching your lifestyle, what you laugh at, where you go, what you allow into your mind, what conclusions would he draw about the God you worship? How would the picture he developed compare to the picture of God we find in the scripture? What if he concluded that the things that seem so important to you must also be important to the God you worship? What if he took his cue about what grieves God by, by watching what grieves you? Would there be any similarities between the God of the Bible and the God you follow? Or would there be a double standard? A huge discrepancy that the observer would entirely get the wrong-headed idea of God and of Christianity. So how can we begin to soften our heart? There's an important principle. The more I love somebody... The less, I am able, the less I am able to tolerate the things that hurt him or her. In the same way as a pastor, the more concern I have for a group of people that I pastor, the more concern I am about the things that, I, that grieve them. As my love increases, as your love increases, the tolerance of things that bring pain to our loved ones decreases. When we love somebody, we become sensitive to and intolerant of the things that could cause potential harm. The same is true about your love for the Lord. Your love for Christ will be reflected in what you will tolerate in life. Facing the reality of a hard heart usually represents a turning point. It's a question of lordship. Who is the lord of your life? It boils down to whose rules are you going to play by? Christ said it this way in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Our hard hearts are transformed through fellowship with our Savior. Only Jesus can make your heart tender and sensitive again. Pursue that relationship and your heart problem will clear up over time. Conclusion. Back to 2 Kings. They did have a hard heart. They did worship idols. 
God did give grace. They were supposed to be a light unto the Gentiles, a city on a hill, a kingdom of priests, if you would. But the but they became just like the nations around them instead of portraying the Lord, the God of the Bible, and the anticipation of the Messiah. They gave in to the culture around them. A hard heart distorts our sense of direction. We lose our bearings. It blinds our eyes to the beacon of Christ's character. Character does require a soft, sensitive heart. We see that with some of the kings of Judah in this book of the Bible. To develop character amidst the numbing climate of our society. Uh, we as Christians cannot afford to be hard-hearted. Search your heart tonight. Ask yourself, do I know Christ? And if you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, how is your relationship with him? When God exposes your darkness to the light of his truth, how are you going to respond? Do you have a hard heart or do you have a soft heart? And note also that God has not cast away his disobedient people, Israel, whom he chose to enjoy a privileged relationship with himself. And neither the writer of 1st or 2nd Kings nor the prophets viewed the division of the kingdom as an excommunication of the ten tribes. Nor did they see the earlier exile of the northern kingdom as a final exclusion of the northern tribes from Israel's future. There will become a day where they all come back to the land as it's starting right now. But also there was also a grace, a remnant does come back after captivity. We're going to go through First and Second Chronicles the next couple weeks as we retrace the kings of Judah and the key verses of that. Then we go to Ezra and Nehemiah and how they came back to the land after 70 years of captivity. So good stuff here in 2 Kings as you read. Hope you have a good evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you. Have a great weekend. Looking forward to seeing you Sunday morning, 9.30 for Sunday school and 10.30 for worship here at Bethlehem Baptist. Have a good evening. God bless you.